Catherine Winter Salary, CEO and founder of Conscious Parenting Revolution, helps individuals minimize misunderstandings and meltdowns in order to communicate with more collaboration, cooperation, and consideration. Through her comprehensive training programs, popular workshops, best selling Amazon ebook, three TEDx talks, and numerous major media appearances, Catherine has taught and coached thousands of parents, educators, social workers, and medical professionals on how to forge stronger relationships with their children. Please welcome Catherine. Welcome, everybody, to Money 911, where we talk about health, wealth, and peace of mind. So you heard about my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Catherine and, and her bio, and it's it, you can't contain it inside of words. I'm just so thrilled and honored to have you here, and we came together like a miracle, actually. Yeah, it's totally. A, I love it. It's, it's a beautiful connection. And I'm really excited about what you're talking about because this is healthy money, our families, our kids, mm -hmm. our living legacy. And I'm all about totally. living legacy. And I think what really got us was the consciousness, right? The consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So conscious parenting, and that is yeah. that's fabulous. What What got you interested in conscious parenting? What got you there? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted, A, to meet you, fall in love with you and be like here already. It's just so fabulous. So life is happening. Yeah. So conscious parenting, what got me into it was, first of all, just as I started having my own children, I realized that I was ill-equipped. I did not know what I was doing and that I was really just kind of winging it, seat of the pants operation. And there wasn't a lot of um, informed, conscious communication, conflict resolution. Um, and, you know, when we use this word discipline, for me, it didn't have any nuance to it. Discipline was simply about, you know, you come down hard on the behaviors you don't like and you get them to do, you know, something that they don't like to do so that the behavior stops. And it was a total behavioralist approach to changing human behavior. And I just felt like I was uh, in need of some really good education. So I started, my husband and I actually started just taking parent education trainings I was in Hong Kong at the time. I was a commodities trader. I was trading non-ferrous metals. I'd gone to law school. I was trained as a mediator. I had a legal background and really a trading background. I spoke Chinese. We ended up in Asia. My husband's an architect. And we were kind of like rocking and rolling, doing the professional thing. And then we started having kids. And at that stage, we were deer in headlights. And we wanted to do more than just wash and repeat and kind of let the patterns, I mean, we both turned out fine, but there was a lot of harm done over the years. And I had had a brother who died by suicide. And I knew a lot of it had to do with what I'm going to call unconscious parenting. Right. And that there was just, there had to be more. Right. There had to be more. And so that was my, that was the impetus was I just wanted to serve these little humans that were my responsibility yeah. with the best of me. Right. And I am so glad I chose to do that. It's so beautiful. It touched my heart. Honestly, I don't have children. So what it's done to me is mm -hmm. made them all mine. Like I feel responsible beautiful. for that. And the way that, just like you said, nobody is consciously teaching this communication nobody is right the healthy communication just like the healthy money nobody's taught about money you know yeah. you go to school you learn how to make it what do you do go make it and give it to somebody else to gamble right and <sighs> and the same thing with the kids how you know it's it's it, and it's so funny because a lot of our money 
mindset Mm -hmm. comes from our family of origin. Boom. You got it. Exactly. Exactly. Just like everything else. Everything is so like that. Yeah. (laughs) So if you have, you know, what do I want to call it? Really conscious um, models for good relationship to risk and money and how to make it. I mean, I was fortunate. I had a dad who was an entrepreneur and he was a trust fund baby. And he also took risks. And I would say I learned as much from his mistakes as I did from his successes. And he had equal measure of both, um, but probably more mistakes than successes. And even though I would say I had the benefit of a really um, unusual front row seat at risk taking, which I know really informed my own ability to take risks. It also helped me know when you take money out. It helped me know that you don't just roll everything over back into the business. It gave me a lot of insight. Um, And I would say I've also fallen prey to some of the family um, risks. Not I should have been more risk averse. Let me put it that way. And I mean, I've landed on my feet, God bless, but it's uh, it could have gone either way. Right, right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I understand. And, and that's such a gift to have that you're able to learn from your folks mm. and the people around you. you. You know, how does the, the guidance approach to parenting, right? It different. Yeah. There, like my daddy brought, he brought Dr. Spock. Can you believe it? You know, he was born in 1919. So the way my dad was 1915. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. They're the same yeah. Buddies. Right. But yeah, my dad was, he had two families. Uh-huh. So, you know, we were the second group of kids from his second family. But, um, and I would say who he was to his first family was very different than who he was to his second family, because by then he was a lot wiser. Right, right. That's interesting. So yeah. it it formed your approach. And, and your core principles are, are different than just some book that you get off, you know, the text. Absolutely. Needs, right. How would you? You know, it? it's, it's so true because part of the platform, I would say, part of my platform that's really core is this idea of children are people too. So children are people too means that we're looking at them as well developmentally obviously you've got a child of two six 12 18 24 i mean at every level there's a developmental expectation which is appropriate Mm -hmm. and to understand developmentally where their brain is their frontal lobes the executive functioning skills all of it neurologically and are my expectations in line with where their brain development is? And, or is it something that I need to look at? Maybe my expectations are a little bit off. And at the same time, the idea, which believe it or not, it really is revolutionary, is that their hearts and souls and their behaviors and actions are either the tragic expression of their unmet needs, attempts to meet their needs always, no matter how flawed and no matter how socially unacceptable. And when we look at the paradigm of you punish the behaviors that you don't want, you reward the behaviors you do want. And we recognize that that is coming from an incredibly outdated perspective on um, child rearing. Mm -hmm. And that its foundation is the idea that you can manipulate someone to change their behavior on the basis of what you do to them or what you give to them. Right. And when you're looking for kids that are self-starters, who have that core understanding of, you know, yeah, I'm doing it because it's in alignment with my values, then it's a lot more about having interactions and conversations and support, which is what the guidance approach is about, as opposed to rewards and punishments and, quote unquote, the use of consequences, which is euphemistically about what am I going to do to you in order to get the behaviors I want without acknowledging that that will lead to retaliation, rebellion, and resistance, the three R's. And 75% of behavioral disruptions are the three R's. So if you're out there listening and you think, yeah, I do get retaliation, rebellion, resistance, it's actually good news for you. 
because with some shifts in your approach to problem solving, you will have completely different outcomes. The harvest will be different. What you reap will be different. And a lot of times clients come to me because the breakdowns are so bad and they know they've been fired and they know their kids aren't coming to them and that they've lost influence. But more than that, they've lost the closeness yeah. and the, you know, there's a lot more pain than there is warmth. Well, you know, that is, that's so, that's so true. And it's really brilliant to, you know, be looking at where the child is and, you know, what, like you said, their, their frontal lobe is, Yeah, I mean, each age has a certain thing that needs to be addressed For sure. and none of the trainings have done that. And yeah, it's, it's, I can see the same thing with the money thing. Each age has something like when you're 20, you don't think about what it'd be like when you're 40, when yeah. you're 40 what's 60. And each thing has a whole component to it. So by dialing that in emotionally, because these poor kids, I've never seen anything. They're under attack. And they're so, yeah, they really are. They're a little vulnerable. They're like pieces of clay. And whatever comes at them uh, will make them soft and hold water or full beautiful. of holes with holes. Yeah. So they'll be in chaos because mm. of like the input. And that's good. why I wanted to support what you're so doing good. because to teach the children. I mean, to me, that's like bottom line. You, you want to you want this thing to keep going forward, to have peace on earth teach yeah. the children and have peace inside, then it'll come. Right. So it's. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, first of all, wow, what beautiful um, analogies and really very touching. Um, and, you know, it makes me think about that song, you know, teach your children. Exactly. Well, yeah. Exactly. And I'm like, yeah, I got to start. I got to, I got to start using that music in the background. But the um, the number of like, I'm just thinking about my clients right now and the heartbreak that's going on with some of the families because they have not gotten the guidance themselves to know how to work through tragic expressions of unmet needs. Mm -hmm. So when our kids don't know how to meet their needs, and they are hurt, and they start to ex explode and everything about their behavior is hard to be around generally socially unacceptable everything in us wants to punish the bad behavior right because it's not nice to be around you could use all kinds of judgments and labels for it you could probably say things like it's mean it's um inappropriate it might be that you would call it disrespectful Every time you want to label the behaviors with the judgment, it gets in the way. Mm -hmm. It's not that those aren't the judgment words that maybe everybody on the planet would use. It could very well be the case. However, it's not going to help you. And so I'm always like, let's just keep our eye on the target. Where do we want to get? Do we want to get them to the point where they can sort of regulate their own emotions? Uh, yeah, for sure. Do we want to get them to the point where they're able to, in spite of high emotion, be able to either say, I'm afraid I'm going to do or say something that's going to really be wrong. And so before I do or say and just act out of knee jerk responses, I'm going to just take care of myself right now. Like, wow, wouldn't that be powerful if kids could just say, I need to right. take care of me right now. Right. Um, there are just so many things that we end up being a knee jerk reaction to because we judge it. And sort of the cornerstone of the conscious parenting revolution is the idea of observation without evaluation. So I can be the observer of what's going on without layering all my evaluations. And that will support me. Um, you know, Krishnamurti used to say, <clears throat> observation without evaluation is the highest form of human intelligence. Staying in that observer mind, which is, you know, part of our meditation practices, our mindfulness practices, part of the practice of living life is the ability to stay out of knee jerk response. Right. And that's a lot about self care. Yeah. And so whenever I see parents who are drowning, mm -hmm. it's the absence of self care. A lot of it is self shaming. A lot of it is self judging. A lot of it is, I don't even need you to say anything bad about me because I say so many bad things about myself all the time. 
Right. right? And so I just yes. want to get everybody out of that conversation Yes, please. because it's unhealthy. It's toxic. It's not good for parents. It's not good for kids. Right. So how can I just be present to, I blew it. I'm embarrassed by my response. I don't even know how I can show my face, whether that's from the child or the parents having blown it spectacularly. I think most of it is just about how do I recover? <laughs> how do I recover and how do I heal my relationship with my kids or with myself or with my parents or with whoever? Because some of the people that I get to work with, not only have they been hurt, but they're also hurting other people. Right, right. And it's just passed down. I mean, really, because the kids really are a collection of mom and dad, mom and dad, and it goes down. And 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 I do see happening. I've seen it around people that when they overcome it, it's almost like stopping that generational in that yeah. family bloodline, stopping that, stop it from and and creating the new way that it should go forward. But it would be it's so spectacular. Yeah. yeah, it's spectacular to be able to see that. I'm just so in awe people who, right. you know, come to that place through their own pain and sadness and hurt yes. and somehow find the courage to just shift out of that whole bandwidth. Exactly. It is a shift. That's why I have a yeah. company called Legacy Shifters and it, yeah. half of it is my behavioral health and mm -hmm. because we all get stuck. I was shocked when I really started to do deep dive inside it to manifest, to come out, to see that I was really pretty much living in my five-year-old. And, you know, my responses yeah. were like, you know, do you like me or you don't like me? You know, like, and yeah. really defensive for, and all the reasonings don't matter, but you got to sure. connect with that. What are you going to, what are you going to give to your kids? And yeah, so well said. It's, it happens all the time. I mean, yeah. I like to say, you know, if we can learn to get bigger than what's bugging us, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Then yeah. we can support our kids in having the inner dialogues so that they can get bigger than what's bugging them. Right. So, this idea of having a sense of who I am that's larger than my pain body a sense of who I am that's larger than my five-year-old, my inner, you know, right. young heart. Yeah. And also to have the compassion because I know um, I have had times in my life where I was so merged with my little five-year-old yeah. and that part of me, it just, it, it had taken over my actions, my behavior and my choices. I wasn't, there was no space between that sense of something inside that tends to be so overwhelming. And it's such a big wave of emotion that for me to be able to turn toward it and for me to be big enough, grounded enough um, that I can turn toward it, that's when I know it's not who I am. Right. And wow, right. when I can be present to it and have my inner structure yes. 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 And a lot, a lot of families, a lot of people, myself included, you know, having a sense of self is not really cultivated. Mm -hmm. It's not really cultivated. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Alice Miller in the drama, The Gifted Child. Did you ever read any of her works? No, I didn't. No. Yeah. Alice Miller was just played a really seminal, important role in my life because she understood that it's for your own good, that kind of parenting that has, you know, it's hurting me more than it's hurting you. Uh -huh. And the response a child can start to develop toward the person who's the quote unquote caregiver is that you begin to just abandon your own feelings mm -hmm. because those feelings are creating anguish for the person outside of you. Right. So for children to speak truth to power, is almost impossible to have a child who has such a deep rooted sense of self that they can actually be an advocate for their own feelings and needs, regardless of the age of the people they're talking to. That's huge. Hmm. Almost impossible. Right.
unless you are cultivating it. Right, right. So you're, you're cultivating a, a conscious communication between the parent, right, and the child. So, yes. and that feeling of collaboration, it goes, so how, what do you do? How do you, how do you manifest that? How do you open that up? That? Yeah, you know, just yesterday I had a coaching call with the cohort that I'm working with right now. And one of them was talking about a conversation she had with her daughter and how she said something about, you know, I, I'm so sorry, I've been working so hard. She's an attorney. And I just feel like I wasn't there for you when you really needed me. And instead of the daughter replying, as we would have hoped, where the daughter says, you know, thanks, mom, I really appreciate you, you know, seeing me and, and understanding how hard that was for me. Instead, the daughter said, mom, you were mean to me long before that. Whoa. And I, I said, as painful as it is to hear that, I want you to celebrate the fact that you have a relationship with your child mm. where that child feels so safe with you. They'll tell you the truth. There you go. Yeah. That, that is huge. Yes. It's huge. Most right. kids don't feel safe enough to say something that they know is upsetting their parent. Right. And so it's. It's actually, I mean, it's hard to hear, of course. And, you know, you got to take time away, which is part of what I help parents do is self-empathy. Yeah. You know, put the oxygen mask on you first. Acknowledge that, wow, that was so hard to hear. That's the last thing I ever wanted to hear. Right. I'm really struggling hearing those words. I'm just going to be with myself and turn toward that part of me that's so hurt. So now I'm bigger than that one little part of me that's hurting rather than collapsing into that pain. And then if I collapse into that pain and now my child sees my pain and might really struggle to understand that they didn't make me feel that way. And that's the other blame thing that happens is that unless we as the adults have worked through the idea that you are a catalyst, but not the cause of my feelings, we turn around and blame people for how That's, we feel all the time. Boom. Exactly. That's as if they caused it That's, as if that's even humanly possible, <laughs> but that area is so murky. Yeah. And so unclear that we perpetuate the cycle of victim blame consciousness through our own language. Yes. And I'm imagining everybody listening to this is probably going, Oh my God, have I done that? And or, oh, my God, somebody's doing that to me right now mm -hmm. and saying things like, well, you know, there are any number of narratives. But if you loved me, you would know how I feel. Exactly. That's like, it's like, what are you kidding me? Like, what, are, you know, what are we all supposed to be psychic and know what other people's feelings are like? And, right. and then am I supposed to be like trapped yeah. in this narrative that you have? No, be responsible for your feelings, share them, right. share your feelings. And then, you know, in NVC, nonviolent communication, we go deeper to, and what are the, the needs that are unmet that are behind these feelings that are arising within you? And are you making me responsible for meeting your needs? Mm. Or are you being responsible for meeting your needs? I mean, like, where are we in the land of just a responsible conversation? That's huge. No, that's just, that is so huge. Now, you immediately, I'm thinking of, you know, an engagement with an adult that I just had. Everything that I had, you know, was blame, that just what everybody's going through that. We're all going through and, it. And, and, and we've struggled to say how we're feeling yeah. and have responsible conversations where the person that we're talking to, we'd like them to modify their behavior. We'd like them to modify their behavior. And that's okay. You can request people doing that. But is it a request or a demand? Usually a demand. <laughs> Usually a demand. I had a client on last night on our group call, a young guy. He's 24. And he's actually an au pair. And he was talking about the, the kid that's in his charge. And he said something along the lines of, he knew it drove me crazy. And he kept on doing it. And I could see like, okay, it's that classic situation of, 
And there was actually a safety factor because he was the driver and they were getting from A to B. And so if I'm the driver and this behavior is driving me crazy, I, I need to take action to protect everybody in the car. I don't have time to figure out why I'm blaming this child for my response. We're way past that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm activated. My nervous system is in, you know, like overdrive right now right. and I'm not driving safely. Right. So whether or not you intended to wind me up, which is a lot of that negative view of children, yeah. this is probably just a kid being a kid, right? Right. Just doing all those annoying, you know, things that immature people do. It's right. part and parcel of childhood. It's almost the definition of childhood, right? Yeah. Immature, not an adult, um, on the road, and along the way is going to do absolutely everything that pushes your buttons. Right. So get responsible for your own buttons and figuring out why that's so annoying. But you can't do all that as you're driving home. So instead, you have to be like, wow, I am so in blame right now. And I am so convinced that this is you doing this to me and that I am completely vulnerable and that you you actually are the puppet of my entire emotional realm. Nevertheless, I'm the driver right. and I need this to change or I'm afraid I'm going to drive us off the road. Exactly. So, you know, and this is kind of like, I guess, the road between mastery and where I am right now. And just being honest about here's why where I am right now. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm not a master yet. And that's okay too. Yeah. And so at least we're in this conversation. We're having this conversation. And it's a better conversation than I had with my parents, where it was just about do it or you're disrespectful. It was really obedience and compliance. And if you were anything but obedient and compliant. It was kind of like there was only one word for that, and it was disrespectful. Right, right. That's that's how they train dogs. I mean, you it know, is how they train dogs. But bad, this is a conversation bad. of how do I speak my truth to power? Right, right. How do children speak their truth to power? There are a lot of families where it's not acceptable. You're supposed to have a happy face. In fact, children are even not allowed to not be happy. It's almost this conversation of entitlement. Like you're not entitled to, to be anything but happy because you're part of the 1% who got, you know, access to education and resources and goodies. Right. And you get one feeling and it's appreciation, young lady. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And it's like, what do I do with all the other feelings? Whoa, get rid of them, right? And so this is how we become disconnected from our feelings is we're told we're not supposed to have them. And I've had a number of people, adults, who are so out of touch with how they're feeling. It's almost like they've been trained not to have feelings, that feelings somehow are the problem. They feelings aren't the problem. Merging with feelings is the problem. Right. Identifying with the feeling that that's who I am. That's a huge problem. Or blaming my feelings on someone or something and then needing to teach them how wrong they were for what they did because of how they made me feel. It's like oh, wow. so <laughs> distorted thinking. Yeah. It it is, it is. And that's why it stays so stuck. And it's so enlightening because it is, if you're just sitting there like the observer and you're watching the movie and, and then somebody says something to me and then I, I get angry or I see my own reactions. I'm the one that pushed, you know, they may have like inspired it, but just like, hey, it, yeah, they were the catalyst, you know, the catalyst, but that something in you that could be pushed that was there already. That's there already. Yeah. Yeah. That's there already. And, you know, in one of the practices I've done for many years, they would say the person who came along and, you know, leaned into that button, they're your gift. Yes, that's right. <laughs> they're your gift because they've given you a shortcut yeah. to find that button that, you know, was buried and it's toxic to you. 
you you know this is so smart because it's like you think the way that we're trained in the world is you know disempowering and so you almost think that if you don't engage with it you know you're not being nice to them but you're giving them the best gift by not playing the game right exactly <laughs> and exactly and you're giving them the best gift by not playing the game so this kind of leads us into this conversation again with my cohort last night it was a really good call and you've got a family where there's a a, a son who is you know, 18 and really went through trauma, bullying, isolation, false accusations. Oh, a lot of stuff. Now, in service to this person's healing journey, there are behaviors that, you know, parents struggle with as they're on their road to recovery. And it's that, that push me, pull me of, how much do I want to be assertive and guide? And how much do I continue to see this person is suffering? And I stay solidly in my corner as a listener mm. who is there to provide a big space to just hold the space for this person's healing. And kind of keep putting my stuff on a back burner. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Not today. I want to talk about that. Not today. And then at some point, I do think we get to a place where it becomes, <clears throat> you're strong enough now to hear my opposition. You get to that. It may not be that you're strong enough until you are. Yeah. And so sometimes that might be called by people who don't have a trauma-informed perspective. They might call it permissiveness. Huh. But if you have a trauma-informed perspective and you understand this person has suffered deeply and they're still in recovery, the behaviors that you'd like to see change, you can you can hold a little more space for. Maybe they're staying up too late. Yeah, I'd like you not to do that. But on the other hand, they haven't learned how to not be engaged in something and be with all of those demons inside. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. so it's one of those where we're like building up their skills to be able to have that getting bigger than what's bugging me, lack of identification with the feelings that are arising, but be present to the feelings, which is, I guess, what I would call the road that didn't exist for a lot of our parents was the idea of being with but not merged with the feelings present to not in denial not in um needing to push away pretend it doesn't exist i mean there were just so many examples and i mean they're still there i had a client say to me not a client actually a, a person i met say something to me about how dangerous it was that schools were teaching his five-year-old about his feelings. And I was like, wow, what has been that parent's education, that feeling education would be so scary. And I imagine it's this idea that you would allow your feelings to guide your behavior. Hmm. <laughs> and that, you would no longer be present to like a feeling that's like, what, what else do we have that kind of is there as the signal, you know, Marshall yeah. Rosenberg to say feelings are the, the light on the dashboard of your car. Exactly. Yeah. If the light doesn't go off, you don't remember to change your oil or you don't recognize that your engine's overheating. And so it really is that, oh, okay, I get it. There's something, there's that dashboard thing going on. Right. I've got to look and see what needs my attention. And so the feeling arises to point us in the right direction to address our underlying unmet needs. So just as a little bit of it, people get so scrambled because they've been taught that certain feelings, you know, that aren't good. I mean, you mean... There's a Go back to the land of judgment. Is that good, a bad, right, wrong. Bad light. Is that right? Yeah. Is yeah. That... Versus a feel. Any feeling is neutral. It's a neutral event. That's this weird. feeling arose. That feeling arose. Another feeling arose. They arise. They come. They go. Yeah. And every time they arise, they're like you know, like 
go that way, go that Oh, let's go look over there, you know, or, you know, yeah. over here. You know? And so they're just, <laughs> they're guideposts. Yeah. Didn't you I didn't that? learn that. I didn't learn that in childhood. I had no yeah. idea. I just knew some feelings were upsetting to my family. Right. And that I shouldn't have had them. Yeah. And then we try to, I don't know, cut parts of ourselves off or cut ourselves off from that something so that it doesn't bother this person outside of me. Isn't that the truth? And that and how much people, even the big, big kids are reacting from exactly what you said, like doing or not doing because what that person's going to think and what that. Yeah. How do I need to modify my behavior in order to um, protect myself from your outburst? <laughs> oh, boy, that's great. That's great. And am I willing to, instead of betraying myself in service to not upsetting you because you live in the land of other people make you feel and I actually have all this power that I can make you feel this way or that way. I mean, child abuse is a parent saying, oh, you make me feel so happy. Mm. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. now I'm responsible for your happiness. Exactly. Whoa, I cannot be responsible for your happiness. No. Holy cow. That's a big one right there. It's a big one. So it's not just you make me mad. You're I'm so disappointed in you. Mm. It's like now I'm responsible for your disappointment or your pride in me. Oh my God. It's too big a burden for me. Somebody who says I'm so proud of you is like, whoa. Mm. Oh my God. Now you're sliming me with that. And, and, and I mean, yeah. praise, you know, we, we know this mm. praise is the number one way to lower your children's self-esteem. So if you don't want to lower your children's self-esteem, don't praise them. People just don't know what you're talking about. And it's so, yeah, hard. it's, but you've taken the time, you know, inside yourself first, obviously, yeah, to be able to see this. A lot of people don't, they're just outside, you know, yeah. trying and striving and all of those things. But you, yeah. you took the time out. Now you have this conscious point of view yeah. that goes for, now you had kids. Now you're going to bring it to your kids, but you had it first. Yeah. That's and I, I also didn't have it until I started having kids That's and I started right. thinking about it and thinking about it. And, you know, if... I look back, I have a few different TED Talks. And, you know, for anybody who's interested, there's one on surviving unconscious parenting. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could say the surviving unconscious parenting really tells the whole long story of what it was like to grow up feeling, you know, so responsible for other people. Yeah, It's, you know, they use a word called codependent. That's yeah. kind of like, the I would say the contemporary word is codependent. And I remember... Um, I had a therapist who, who just, she was like, I don't like codependent anonymous. I don't like codependence anonymous. And I was like, well, tell me more about that. And, um, and she says it pathologizes the human condition. Hmm. And I thought you're right. Actually codependence is the human condition. And it does kind of pathologize it, although I got a tremendous amount of value from Codependence Anonymous, so I'll just do a plug there. Um, and at the same time, I also see, yeah, it does, it pathologizes the human condition because the human condition across cultures, genders, everything is that around the planet. And I mentioned to you, I lived in Hong Kong for 33 years and I lived in Hong Kong longer than I lived in America. Hmm. Wow. And most of my clients in that 33 year period of time, I would say, oh my goodness, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, European, American, just a worldwide parent base. Um, Cause Hong Kong is a melting pot like New York city and so many different cultures. And somebody would say to me, well, you know, but you don't understand the Chinese culture, or you don't understand the Korean culture, or you don't understand the American culture, this, that, and the other thing. And what it really came down to was it just came down to across the planet, it was a culture. And that's the culture of, because I said so. 
It's the culture of power and control. It's the culture of ageism. I feel like I get to highlight what I'm going to call the last marginalized community, and that's children. Mm. And their feelings and needs have been marginalized. And it's part of a, you know, um, like, you know, I don't want to pathologize the human condition. It's part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. And that means there's nobody who is to blame. Right. It's just that we were all bathed in this human condition, vibrational frequency, mindset, way of looking at things. And it is pervasive. Right. And we're all just coming to terms with our own experience of the pain that we went through as a result of unconscious parenting, where the foundation of the parenting model was usually fear and dependency. You need to be afraid of me or else right. <laughs> what I'm going to do to you. Yeah. And so that fear element was a big part of it. And it wasn't really about understanding children's feelings and needs and, you know, with the overlay of developmentally, where are they? What can be expected? Are my expectations appropriate or inappropriate? Do I need to adjust or do I need to support them in adjusting? Almost always, I think it's about skills, my own for sure. And then their ability to articulate in ways that are socially acceptable, which of course is the game is getting to the point where I can express my feelings and needs in ways that are socially acceptable. So I don't have to go out and express my feelings and needs in ways that are not only not socially acceptable, but they're dangerous. Dangerous. And this is where I talk about school shootings. Mm -hmm. And another one of my Ted talks is about this specifically. Mm -hmm. The rebellion is here. We created and we can solve it, but not if we don't shift Mm -hmm. around seeing these tragic expressions of unmet needs as a symptom, as the presenting problem, but not the underlying issue. Mm. And if we are in triage all the time dealing with presenting problems, rather than addressing the underlying unmet needs, and in a lot of these kids, it's the need for community, friendship, connection, belonging. And instead, they are socially isolated because their own behaviors push people away And they need to be responsible, but they don't have any role models. And they just kept getting punished for the absence of skills rather than someone teaching them the skills. That is so well, that's just brilliant. And so well said. said. And parents sitting out there listening to this, and and maybe they're hesitant about conscious parenting and yeah they want it how would they how do what do you want to encourage them or what would you say to them to get them over that because they're the ones that have to get over it to begin the conscious for sure i think the first part of the conversation is don't make this a shame storm yeah because i think that that gets in the way of change is when we just begin to feel oh, I screwed up. It's my fault. How could I have done that? And it turns into this negative spiral. Yeah. We didn't know any better until we did. (laughs) I make, I make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if I let my mistakes and my, um, I don't know, what do I say? Disappointment in myself get in the way of, you know, putting one step in front of the other, I would not do what I do. And I know that it would get in the way of being of service to parents who need support because I would be so wrapped up in my own sort of sense of I'm not perfect. I'm not. And that's part of our journey is to let our kids know we're not. And it's okay for them not to be perfect too, because perfection is the most toxic it leads to socially prescribed perfectionism. Socially prescribed perfectionism is the most toxic, dysfunctional form of self-esteem where I feel good about myself if other people tell me how good I am. Right, right. And it's what I think, again, we're back to that pathologizing the human condition. The human condition is that almost everybody has grown up in families where it's about, I feel good about me if I'm praiseworthy. But if they don't praise me, then how do I feel about myself where the healthy thing that we can start doing is reflecting back and using the power of acknowledgement, you know, wow, you know, congratulations, you worked really hard on that. Did you know you could do that? 
that that seems like that took you a lot of effort. How do you feel about that? And we're always helping the child and the mind of the child not be guided toward thinking about what other people think about me and falling into that people pleasing trap. And, oh, you know, if somebody's upset with me. It's my fault. I have to make them not be upset with me. It's, you know, what right. that's again, we're not in the land of being responsible. We're in the land of being um absolutely subject to and puppets of the world around us. I don't think that's how we want to be. And I don't think it's how we want to raise our kids. No, no. And it's true. Recognition is ignition. So there's something that arcs. It's like, a yes. And that's the land of acknowledgement. Yes. And that's the difference between praise. And I mean, you know, this is, this is such an important distinction. Yes. So much. Tell everybody how and where they get your book, the name of the book, how to get Yes. It. So I have a seven strategies to keep your relationship with your kids from hitting the boiling point. And so those seven strategies are available in my freeparentingbook.com. If you just go to freeparentingbook.com, um, it's my gift to you. And hopefully you'll find some kernels, some nuggets to get you on the road. And um, the consciousparentingrevolution.com is my website. And I publish a blog a week on everything from gaming addiction to social media to really how do I build or rebuild my relationship with the co-parent that I'm, you know, co-parenting this child. If you're divorced and you don't have a great relationship, that can change. I know a lot of people are like, it'll never change because he's this or she's that or whatever. But actually, yeah. even with those people, there can be significant changes. So not to say they aren't that way. Maybe they are. But you can take the remote control back into your own hands Beautiful. and feel much more empowered if you're feeling disempowered by someone else's toxicity. Beautiful. Catherine, this has been such a fabulous conversation. It's so fun. I could yeah. go on. I know. We could go on. Forever. We'll just have to do it again. We'll have a, a yes. conscious, Let's do that. conscious series because we have the conscious giving council that works all together with the beautiful, right? The conscious just being present and yeah. you know, everything you've been saying, it, you articulate it very nice. We'll Thank have you. to write a song for you. I like for, it. For, you know, I'm a songwriter in my spare time. So. <laughs> Check, check oh out my Chris, gosh. ChrisMillerMusic.com. I had was I, you know, was entered in the Grammys a couple times. I didn't win. <laughs> but, Whoa, but you were acknowledged as Grammy, you know, worthy. Well, Congratulations. It rang the bell, and I'm actually on a record label right now, but my my favorite thing is writing songs so you and I can we can hook together and you can design what style you want. I can hardly wait. That sounds like a blast. It's fun. It's so fun to be able to use our gifts to share and yeah. raise the consciousness because, you know, people are really making their choice to be conscious or fall asleep. And it's so true. And, you know, we might find that there are areas we are so conscious and so, you know, tuned in. And then we've got our blind spots. Well, we all do. My goodness. Yeah, I really sometimes I go after all these decades, you still <laughs> I know, right? It's just astonishing. Uh, there's a transformational leader that um, took my training. And it was so interesting because she's, you know, just such an extraordinary leader. And she said, I know my blind spot. It's with my kids. Yeah. And I'm not who I want to be. And I was like, wow, bingo. That is so cool. Like, yeah. and I think if we have that sense within ourselves of yeah. Yeah, I'm going to just take this on. I'm going to get to the point where I feel really good about my skills. Yes. Yeah. Conscious, conscious, conscious parenting. parenting. It's a revolution. Why? It because, is. you know, I think that it's still a lot of people still think, oh, it's like breathing. Mm. I should just be able to do it. And so the revolution is that, oh, come on, people, right? We all know. Nothing is more complex than our families. That's right. And the responsibility, right? Yeah. So it's a conscious, it's a conscious spiritual revolution. I think yeah. I see, I agree. And, I feel, and, and, and that consciousness is raising up and bring all the good with it and transform yeah. everything else along the way. And yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Catherine, so lovely. Thank you yeah. so much. You're just a beam of light. Oh, you made my day. <laughs>
<laughs> really, I see that light just shine through you. I'm like, wow, you are a beam of light, a little light beam over there. <laughs> oh, well, that, that, that's what we're supposed to do, be a light to the world, right? And yeah, people love that. This, all this darkness that kind of, it didn't go away, but we got to get through it and we'll hold each yeah. other's hands and yeah. we have gifts that I don't have and vice versa. And exactly. Together, we're like one one unit. But you know, it's so funny. I bought one of those tea towels that has a message on it. I love those. And this one said, so you say it takes a village to raise a family. Like, do they, you know, just show up or, you know, is there a number I call? <laughs> where, where is this village? <laughs> where are. How do I connect to the, yeah. I was like, oh, that's so funny. It's, yeah. Uh, well, we are. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gathering the wagons, right? Circling the wagons. Yeah. Now, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Let, it's let, really beautiful. We're, yeah, we're a tribe. That's it. Let the song ring out. All right. Beautiful. All Thank right. you so much, Chris. Thank this you. Thank you. We'll we'll say goodbye. We'll just say see you again. I'll see you again. All right. There's so much to learn about healthy money. I hope today's discussion brings you one step closer to securing and protecting your future. So you can get started on the right foot, go to meetwithchrismeller.com and schedule your free financial fitness strategy session. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to Money 911 so you don't miss our next episode, which includes health, wealth, and peace of mind.